Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Get your King James Bibles and turn to the book of Isaiah. We're going to read chapters 36 and 37. Now, a little background. Assyria took captive the northern kingdom of Israel, whose capital was Samaria, took them all away, and transplanted some other people from other lands. So what they would do, basically, if you're from the U.S., uh, it's like taking people from Georgia and putting them in New York and then the people from New York and putting them in Georgia. And this way, when you mixed people up and around, they were less likely to start a rebellion. Plus, you know, you're taking them out of their homeland and they don't know where everything is. You know, uh, let's face it, if you're have an army of guerrillas in their home country, they know the layout of the land, they know where things are, and that gives them an advantage. And that's been proven many times in military history. But when you take the people and move them to a new area, that advantage is gone, it's negated. So, all right, so the Assyrians came and took the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten northern tribes, took them captive and left the poor of the land there, but they took the great majority of the people and brought them to another place. And the capital of the northern kingdom was Samaria. Well, those people never returned to the land, unlike what happened in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah and Daniel, whereas Babylon came and took Jerusalem captive for 70 years, and then after that they returned. But the northern tribes of Israel, they never returned. But the Assyrians also took parts of Judah captive too, uh, some of the smaller cities and towns. But this is the account of what happened when they tried to take Jerusalem. Assyria had a very large army. And uh, so, according to history, when Assyria collapsed and Babylon took over, the people of Israel, who had been taken captive, fled to the north. They didn't go back to their homeland. They left. They went north. Because the Assyrians were really bad. Uh, if you want to read a little bit about Israel's interactions with the Assyrians, you could read the book of Jonah. They had a fish god called Dagon, which, uh, take a look at Dagon, and you're looking at Disney's Little Mermaid. It had a human, from the waist up, it had a human figure, and from the waist down, it was a fish and they took their captives and oftentimes would take a hook and a line and put the hook through the people's mouth, through their lips or their, you know, put a hook in their mouth. Um, I'm quite sure that that was not pleasant. So, the Assyrians took a portion of Judah captive in addition to Israel. But this is the account of what happened when they tried to take Jerusalem. Now God made a promise to King David uh, that he would protect Jerusalem for his sake. And if you read in Jeremiah 3 and verse 8, you will see that God divorced Israel but not Judah. So, matter of fact, I guess we could uh, take a look at that real quick. And um, 
see what it says. Jeremiah 3 8. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, spiritual adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not but went and played the harlot also. So Israel and Judah were not the same. Now if you read in Jeremiah 31, 31, it, the Lord promises that he would give a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So God divorced Israel, but not Judah. All right, so let's go read Isaiah 36. You've got a little bit of background here. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defensive cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakan from Lachish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him Eliakim, Hil Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, Asaph's son, the recorder. And Rab Shechem, Shechem said unto them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? So here is the Assyrian ambassador is speaking to people of the king of Jerusalem, Hezekiah. What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? I say, trustest thou, I'm sorry, I say, sayest thou, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon, if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all that trust in him. So here it is, you've got Judah trusting in the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, instead of trusting in the Lord. Verse 7. But if thou say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, Ye shall worship before this altar? So it was Hezekiah that uh, took away the satanic places against that they were worshiping and reinstituted, well, I should say reconfirmed temple worship. So, seems to me that Hezekiah was a good king because, you know, not only had Israel fallen away worshiping in the high places, Satanism, but a lot of Judah had also done the same thing, which is why the Lord allowed the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, to come and take him captive. You know, the gods, uh, God's a just God. I mean, if, if you want to worship Satan and bad things happen to you, well, cry out to Satan. Have him deliver you. You know, don't worship Satan and then when you get in trouble, call me. Uh-uh, no, you're going to get a busy signal. That's the Bob translation. So, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Now therefore give pledges, I pray thee, to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give thee two thousand horses, if thou be, a, uh, be able on thy part to set riders upon them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants, and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots 
and for horsemen. And am I now come without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Then said Eliakim and Shebna and Joab, I'm, I'm sorry, Joah unto Rabshakan, Speak, I pray thee, unto thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it, and speak not to us in the Jews' language, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. But Rabshakeh said, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? You see, in a siege, when an army surrounds a fenced city, you know, you can't go out and get food, and you can't go out and get water. So basically, these people are starving, slowly starving to death. They don't have any fresh water, and uh, they're eating. He's basically saying, oh, they're going to drink their number one and eat their number two, if you catch my drift. Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and eat ye every, eat ye every one of his vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, Beware, lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? So, the Assyrians had conquered many other areas that worshipped gods other than the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's what he's saying. Has did their gods, were their gods able to deliver these people? And the answer is no. Who are they among all? I'm sorry, verse 19. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Sephavim? And have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Now remember, Samaria was the capital city of northern Israel. Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? And the answer is no. The Assyrians took Samaria. And remember, uh, Israel was ten tribes. Jerusalem was only... Uh, Benjamin, Judah, and Levi. Samaria was much had many more people than just Jerusalem. So he took up the more powerful of the two nations if you go by population wise, but not spiritually wise. Verse twenty. Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered? their land out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. But they held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, saying, Answer him not. Then came Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, that was over the household of Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder to Hezekiah with their clothes rent, and told him the words of Rab Shaka. All right, let's go to chapter 37. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. 
And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, unto Isaiah, the son, I'm sorry, the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble, and of rebuke, and of blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. In other words, a, a woman's getting ready to be delivered of child, but she doesn't have the strength to bring the child forth. So, in other words, the child and the woman are, are going to end up dead. Verse 4. It may be the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rab Shekah, whom the king of Assyria his master hath sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayers for the remnant that is left. See, Assyria had taken most of the land of Judah and all the cities. Basically, Jerusalem, the capital city, is all that's left. So, the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say unto your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land." So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he had departed from Lachish. And he heard concerning Terhaka, king of Ethiopia, he has come forth to make war with thee. And when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall ye speak. To Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly. And shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and Rezeph? And the children of Eden, which were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, and the king of Arphad, and the king of the city of Serhav, Sephar, Vaim, Hena, and Iva? And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers, and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord, and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear, open thine eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the king of Assyria, hath have laid waste all the nations and their countries, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods. But the work of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, our, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent unto Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Whereas thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord hath spoken concerning him, the virgin, the daughter of Zion hath despised thee, and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom 
hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel. If you don't get it, Isaiah is basically telling the children of Judah, oh, you think Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, has blasphemed the Lord? Take a look in the mirror, people. Take a look in the mirror and, and tell me who blasphemed the Lord God of Israel, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, that's, that's the Bob translation. All right, so... Verse 24. By thy servants hast thou reproached the Lord, and hast by, and hast said by the multitude of thy chariots, am I come up to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and I will cut down the tall cedars thereof, and the choice fir trees thereof, and I will enter in the height of his border, and the forest of his Carmel. I have digged and drunk water, and with the sole of my feet have I dried up all the rivers of the besieged places." Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it, and of ancient times that I have formed it? Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldest be to lay waste defensive cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field, and as the green herb, as the grass on the housetops, and as corn blasted before it be grown up. But I know thy abode, and thy going out, and thy coming in, and thy rage against me. Because thy rage against me, and thy tumult is come up into thine ears. Therefore will I put my hook in thy nose, and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way which thou camest. And this shall be a sign unto thee, ye shall eat this year such as groweth of itself, and the second year that which springeth of the same, and the third ye year sow ye and reap, and plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Now there's a interesting thing, a study in the um, on Jeremiah, a legend in the Christian identity movement, that the prophet Jeremiah took daughters of the kings of Judah, I think it was Tamar, I'm not sure, I'd have to look it up, but they escaped into Egypt and then they escaped into um, the British Isles. Tia Tifa, if I remember correctly, T-E-A-T-E-P-H-I, I believe. And then they married into Irish royalty. Um, and they took the stone of scone, um, the pillar of Jacob, which is now the coronation stone for the Queen Elizabeth and that line. I don't know how true it is, but wouldn't surprise me if it is true. You know, but I think that's what, if it is true, that's what this verse is referring to, verse 31. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. I mean, let's face it, people. Um, the British Isles, they were the ones that printed the King James Bible. They're the ones that stood against the Pope and Spain. Matter of fact, uh, at least twice, England, which was a second-rate power at best, defeated the most powerful armada of Spain in the whole world, not once, but twice. And when England, Britain, had honored the Lord, they had an empire look at them today they have forgotten the lord now they're they're a second world nation now basically that's flooded with heathens so all right verse 31 
And the remnant that has escaped in the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant. And they that escaped out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, shall do this. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. Um, we're not talking about a, a bank that holds money. We're talking about, um, you know, like a river bank. Verse 34. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into the city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Here's the punchline. Then the angel of the Lord, then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. That's 185,000 soldiers, people. That is one large army. 185,000. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Uh, if I read this correctly, one angel struck dead 185,000 soldiers. It says the angel of the Lord. It doesn't say angels. Basically, one angel wiped out an army. One. Now, this could be the pre-incarnate Christ, I'm not sure. Verse 37. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. Now Nineveh was where Jonah, you know, Jonah and the whale, where Jonah went to preach repentance to them. That was their capital city. Verse 38. And it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of Nisrosh, his God, that Ad Ramelech and Shahrezer his son smote him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia. And Esa Esar Haddon, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, Armenia is in the area of. Turkey. I mean, it's where you're getting into the Euro Asian continent. All right, so let's take a look at something. Ah, uh, let's take a look at 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 8. Now, the Assyria uh, and Assyria, from what I understand, According to history, uh, the Assyrians were a Semitic people, and modern-day Syrians are descended from some of those same people. However, uh, there is a Arabic influence there, so the Syrians are somewhat related to the Assyrians, but there's differences, and they cover some of the same areas. I'm not sure I understand the nuances of the differences perfectly, but all right, so let's go to 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with the servant, saying, in such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. 
And the king of Israel sent to the place where the man of God told him and warned him of it, and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto him, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, uh, he's like, there's a spy here, you know, uh, and they're, every time I make a plan, somebody's telling the king of Israel our plans. That's the Bob translation. Verse 12, And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. So they were going to try to capture Elisha, who was the successor of Elijah. Verse 15, And when the servant, the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with us with them. Oh boy. And that reminds me of a verse, 1 John 4.4. 4, Ye are of God little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Verse 16 of Second Kings chapter 6. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. Open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire, round about Elisha. Chariots of fire. These are, you know, horses and chariots of fire. This has got to be, you know, an angelic army, people. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass, when they were come into Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men, that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. So these angels struck this army with blindness, you know, just like what happened in uh, with Lot and his family in uh, Sodom, right? And the king of Israel said unto Elisha when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? You know, I mean, I'm sure he's got his army surrounding this group of people that had just recovered their sight. And he's saying, well, Shall I kill him? Verse 22. And he, Elisha, answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldst thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive by thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Ah. I mean, let's face it. All Elisha had to do probably was, you know, pray for the Lord to smite the army with blindness and they'd have been blind again, you know, if they would have tried to fight their way out. So, you know, 
Um, the Lord had showed them great kindness by not allowing them to be killed and to return to their master in Syria. So, you know, when you got an army that tells you we were struck with blindness and then they, we got our sight back and then we were fed and given water and then allowed to leave, um, I don't think I'd want to fight those people, you know? I mean, let's face it, one angel wiped out uh, 185,000 troops, killed that many, and then he struck another group here with blindness. All right, let's get ready to close this out. Turn to Matthew chapter 26. And verse 26, Matthew 26, 26. Now, this is the Last Supper. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But, uh, but after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. <laughs> I love Peter. I did a I did a, a Bible study on the life of Peter. Check it out. He he had to be my favorite apostle because I guess he reminds me most of me. Uh, verse thirty four. Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee that that this night before the cock crow thou shalt. Deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise said all the disciples. Be careful what you say, people. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time, and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Can you imagine? Christ was probably up all day, all night, was taken to Ananias and Caiaphas, was tried and beaten, and then taken before Rome and then crucified. Ugh. All to show us the love of God. It's hard for me to even think about it. And he left them and went away and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And while he yet spoke, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves, 
from the chief priests and elders of the people. Yeah, and then they want to tell you the Romans did this. No. The chief priests. And these were not Catholic priests. Verse 48. Then he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Boy, is that sarcasm? Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hold on Jesus and took him. And behold... One of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Now when you read the book of, uh, I think it's Luke, when you read this parallel account in Luke, you find out that it was Peter that did this. Peter is by himself pulled out his sword against a great company and was willing to fight for Jesus knowing full well that he'd probably be killed. And he cut off the servant of the high priest's ear. Verse 52. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Here's the punchline. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels 12 legions of angels now remember one angel killed 185,000 men what would 12 legions of angels do from what I understand a legion was about two to three thousand uh, strong so 12 legions would be from 24 to 36,000 angels. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And, that, and they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. And Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. So I think you all know the rest of the story. You know, Jesus could have called on angels, but he didn't because otherwise... The scriptures could not have been fulfilled. Think about it, people. Um, are we compassed about with angels? That we, like the servant of Elisha, that our eyes are spiritually blind, that we can't see them? I believe it. Consider this. Matthew 18 and verse 10. Jesus speaking. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. The children, right? Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels, their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Yes, the little ones have angels that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. 
So there you have it, people. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, and his heavenly Father, um, and Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, in his precious name, amen.